The Chaco Canyon National Monument was created in 1907, and it became a National Historic Park in 1980. And in 1987, it became a World Heritage Site. 1,100 to 1,200 years ago, Native people made this high desert valley the center of their world. They created monumental architecture and developed far-reaching commerce and a complex social organization. The Chaco people began to build here on a grand scale in the mid-800s. They used masonry techniques, which were unique for the time. They continued to expand their massive, multi-story stone buildings for over 300 years. From the start, they planned their buildings to have hundreds of rooms. Constructions of some Great houses span decades or even centuries. Each one is different, but all share features distinct to the Chaconian architecture. The great houses of Pueblo Bonito, Una Vida, and Peñasco Blanco rose in the mid to late 800s. Ungo Pavi, Chetro Quetl, Pueblo Alto, and many others followed. Often oriented to solar, lunar, and cardinal directions, some great houses incorporated sophisticated astronomical markers. By the early 1100s, Chaco Canyon had become a ceremonial, administrative and economic center. Road networks linked dozens of great houses in the canyon to over 200 throughout the region. The mountains, mesas and shrines sacred to Chacoans continued to hold deep spiritual meaning for their descendants. According to oral traditions, people converged at Chaco because it was a sacred place, 
and several Navajo and Pueblo clans and ceremonies originated here. It may have been a so-called center place, binding regional peoples through a shared vision. Or was it the hub of a network set up to trade turquoise for macaws, copper bells, shells, and other items from distant lands? Did Chaco redistribute food and resources to growing populations when climate failed them? Continuing research may reveal answers to these questions. hundreds, reorganization of the Chacoan world led to a shift in focus to other regional centers. Chaco's influence could be seen in places like Aztec, Mesa Verde, and Chusca Mountains, and other centers to the north, south, and west. Today, many of the southwest tribes are Chaco descendants. For these individuals, Chaco is still seen as an important stop on their clan's sacred migration paths and a spiritual place to be honored and respected. To the past. Over 400 miles of prehistoric road networks carried goods linked to Chaco to outlying communities and resource areas. One of the longest roads headed north towards the prehistoric communities of Salmon and Aztec. These were not mere foot trails, but carefully engineered roads, labor intensive to build and maintain. The road system is most elaborate near the great houses where two and four lane segments may have related to ritual and ceremony. While the roads served as a practical purpose, they also may have held a greater meaning that reflected the Chacoan worldview. Between the early 1900s and mid 1100s, Chaco was the center of far-reaching trade networks, extending in all directions. Seashells, macaws, copper bells, and cacao chocolate are evidence that Chacoans traded with others as far away as central Mexico. Chacoans valued turquoise highly and left great quantities of ornaments, offerings, and work site debris in the canyon. They imported raw turquoise from distant mines, crafting it into exquisite beads, necklaces, and pendants. There was a small frog they found in Pueblo Bonito that was carved from a very black jet, and it has a collar of eyes of inlaid turquoise. 
also, the distinctive black on white Cibola pottery may have originated in communities to the north and to the west. Most of the pottery found at Chaco was probably made elsewhere. Regarding masonry, the Chacoans used stone tools to construct vast communal buildings that still compel our admiration. Their techniques evolved over centuries. The earliest walls were one stone thick and bonded with generous courses of mud and mortar. At Pueblo Bonito, the oldest walls are of this masonry type. To make higher, longer walls, Chacoan builders widened the rebel cores and added structural stone veneers and internal wooden supports. Another type of masonry used large tabular sandstone blocks chinked with smaller stones set in mortar. Chacoans developed ever more intricate masonry styles through the mid to the late 1000s. Yet they covered many walls in plaster, sometimes with painted or engraved decorations. By the early 1100s, a different style known as Makelmo became prominent. Seen in Kin Clesto and elsewhere, it has thinner rebel cores and thicker veneers of shaped stand sandstone. are part of the sacred homeland of the Hopi, the Pueblo peoples of New Mexico, and the Navajo, among others. Contemplating these constructions, so old and so full of civilizing significance, makes us aware of the great capacity of the indigenous peoples of the Americas. Sadly, much has been lost since the arrival of colonizers on the American continent. However, when looking to the future, one can imagine the additional great contribution to be made to world civilization by the native peoples of the Americas. Abdul Baha in the Tablets of the Divine Plan reminds us of the story of the ancient inhabitants of the Arabian Peninsula who were considered savages, but when the light of Muhammad's revelation shone upon them, they became so enlightened that they transformed the world. And he reminds us that Likewise, these Indians, should they be educated and guided, there can be no doubt that they will become so illumined as to enlighten the whole world. Mm -hmm.